So thank you very much, Martin. We, we're really glad to have you here at the AfriMap Bar Community Meetup. Very excited to hear about um, the maps that you've made and the stories behind them, especially learning more about the different technologies that you've used and just thinking about what is important when you are making maps. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to you. Okay, thank you, Anala, and thanks for the invitation to talk about um, the maps that I made. It's a real honor. Um, so, who am I? A little bit um, of an introduction. I'm a data visualization freelancer based in Belgium. So what I do is I make visualizations, both static and interactive ones for a wide range of clients, um, companies, government agencies, and nonprofits. Um, I also give trainings in data visualization. So I'm not a professional cartographer, but throughout my career as a freelancer, but also before that, I have been making a lot of maps. And um, in this session, I would like to share with you some of these maps and how they came to be. And I'm going to focus a little bit on the tools that I use for the map um, and also on why the tool was a good fit for that specific map. Um, so we're going to see 10 different mapping tools. Um, so it's not very R focused, although R will be mentioned. Um, but I think it's also interesting for people um, making things or coding in Python or R that um, knowing that there are other tools out there that can make different kinds of maps sometimes much more easy than what you would get from these coding tools. And uh, this is the first map that I want to show you. And this map I made when I was working for a Belgian newspaper here. And at that time, the government had published a big data set about um, real estate prices at a very granular uh, geographical level. So we could show the prices of real estate at the uh, community level. So we have municipalities here in Belgium, but this is um, even more fine grained. So what you see here is a map of the city of Mons and the red areas are the communities which have low real estate prices and the blue ones have high real estate prices. So I was working at the newspaper at that time and we made a series of 12 of these maps, so for 12 different cities. And those maps ended up being part of a magazine that went with the newspaper. So here you see the same map, but for Antwerp, city of Antwerp, um, with the same colors. And my colleagues at the newspaper used the maps to visit the areas on the maps and talk with people in these areas about the trends in real estate prices um, in, in these uh, communities. So the tool I used for making these maps is QGIS. So QGIS, it's an open source GIS and people familiar with GIS will probably have heard about it because it's, it's free and open source while other software might be very costly. And, over the years, QGIS has matured a lot. So in the beginning, it was uh, it had, didn't have much functionality and it could be kind of buggy. But I think today it's, it's a real mature uh, GIS and you can use it not only to make maps, but also to do geographical data processing and modeling, um, many different things related to GIS. Um, but I mainly use it to make static maps. And um, it has some map making features that um, make me prefer QGIS for certain maps over uh, making maps in R, for example. Um, and most have to do with the, the styling of things, which um, with the tools I use in R are pretty hard to, um, to get what I want. So um, for very, um, publication ready maps, I usually go for QGIS. So that's the, the first two. The next map was also made with QGIS. So you see here a map of the country of Hungary and its administrative boundaries of the first level. 
Um, but the finishing touches of the map were done in another tool. So I used Adobe Illustrator to put the labels on the map because that is actually something that I find that QGIS is not very good at. So if you look closely, you can see that all the labels, all the names of these regions of Hungary fit really well into their polygons. And here, for example, on the left, we have a label that is split over three lines. Here we have one over two lines. We have a little connector here connecting Budapest with, with its polygon in the center. Um, and on top of that, if you look closely, you'll notice that there's a little fading gradient on, on the map. So on the outside, it fades to white. So these finishing touches, both the labeling and, and this gradient were done in Adobe Illustrator. So I prepared the map in QGIS, just uh, the boundaries of, of these polygons, of these regions and the dots for these capitals here. But then I put the labels on the map in Illustrator and then applied this gradient as well. And I found that Illustrator um, is used a lot among professional cartographers because um, if you really, really want the details to be right and you want some effects on the map, then QGIS will not cut it. And, and that's why many cartographers use Illustrator, um, myself included. And so this map of Hungary was published in this article here that I'm going to show you. Um, it's an article on a website called pudding.cool. And this is a website, website focusing on producing interactive and data-driven stories. So I pitched to them a story about um, the regions of the EU splitting. And, and changing their boundaries to get more funding from, from the EU. Um, so it's a, it's a bit of a dry topic, but uh, I think I managed to make it engaging and interactive. And um, you see here two maps similar to the one I just showed you. It just shows you Hungary and its regions. And you can see that one region was split in two um, on the 1st of January, 2018. And the article basically explains why Hungary um, did this split of uh, that region. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail here. If you like, you can read the article um, after the session. Um, but I'm just going to show you some of the features, the interactive features um, of this map here that I'm showing, and then I'll dive into how I made the, this map. So um, you can see here a Horoplot map of the EU. And uh, now it shows the regional level. So the green areas have a higher GDP per capita and the pink ones have a lower GDP per capita. Um, and this is data that is used to distribute some of the funds of the EU across all the, the regions in the EU. And so this is an interactive map. You can hover over the regions and you'll get the name of uh, the region. And you can also highlight individual countries here. So you can see that the north of Italy um, is richer than the south. And the same applies to Belgium, um, the country where I'm from. Here we can highlight the least developed regions so you can see where they are uh, located. Um, of course, this was pre-Brexit. So UK regions are still represented on the map. Um, and then I wanted to focus on something else than the geography. And that's why I decided to change the view and the data from the map to a different plot. So um, I don't know how this will show on um, through the Zoom stream, um, but you should see an animation between the chart and the map just to make sure that people understand that what they are seeing on the chart is actually the regions that they were seeing um, on the map before. Um, and then the story continues. just waiting for the animation to finish. We have this one outlier here, a very rich um, region, a part of London. So it distorts the view on the data. So I zoom in a little bit and then I'll explain how um, the different colors are used to distribute the money coming from the EU uh, among the regions. 
So here you see the same map that I showed you before and a little animation shows you why that region was split into two. You have um, one poorer part that's moving to the left and one richer part that's moving to the right and you can see the, the two maps. So this map here is, um, of course, this is online and interactive. And for that, I usually use JavaScript and the, a JavaScript library called D3. And D3 is a bit of the standard for making custom and interactive visualizations online. Um, it's, a, it's a big library with many different functions that can help you build interactive um, visualizations. And one of the modules of D3 is called D3Geo. And D3Geo helps you to make maps uh, online. And um, it has built-in projections, different projections. It has built-in functions to turn GeoJSON into um, SVG paths. So the, the visual um, of this map here and, and the chart is SVG. So it's um, a file format or a specification of HTML that you can use to make graphics. And um, Didri Geo can help you go from geographical data like GeoJSON into this SVG coordinate system and um, show uh, polygons on a map. Another thing that I used here is Flubber. Uh, Flubber is also a JavaScript library and it can um, animate between shapes in SVG. So you can see here what it's capable of. I think there are some examples here below. Um, so here, for example, it's morphing between different um, geographical areas. Um, and so it's really fun to work with. Um, but I try to use it also in a functional way in, in the article about the region splitting up. Um, so these are two JavaScript libraries that were really helpful for me building the map. Um, D3 and especially D3Geo and then um, Flubber. And this is a map I made for the Sustainable Development Goal Atlas in 2020. And this was for the World Bank. And so there are 17 sustainable development goals and we produced 17 stories um, about each of these goals. And the 14th story or SDG 14 is about life below water. So um, what I wanted for this story was to have a map that really focuses on the oceans and the seas instead of on the land area. So I used a very specific uh, projection for this map that keeps the oceans intact and splits up the continents. Um, so it's really um, um, an ocean centric map projection that I use here. And um, the way I use it here is that we have this map in view and then we have some explanation about the map so this map is showing coral reefs worldwide and the story highlights some of the issues with coral reefs so you have these dead zones in some areas you also um, have coral bleaching and then um, the map changes to um, the uh, the reason for the bleaching which is that um, oceans are warming up and the color coral can adapt. So here is a map showing the ocean heat content, um, shipping cumulative effect of um, humans on the ocean. Um, so I'm, I'm reusing the same projection. And um, yeah, because this is all about the seas, I wanted to use this specific projection. And this was what a challenge. So the way I did it is first prepare um, a regular map or a map with a regular projection. So this is a map showing the locations of the coral reefs and also the bathymetry, so the elevation of the seafloor, just to give it a, a little bit of um, texture. And then um, someone helped me to turn this image and, and warp it into this projection that I wanted. So um, this is the example that I used and it's it's actually it, it, it's not running anymore and I'll 
going to notify the author of this uh, observable notebook. But you can see there's a, a lot of math involved in, in my browser locally. So I could warp the map that I made in QGIS on this new um, projection. And um, then um, I took a screenshot of that map, then added the labels in Illustrator and then um, exported it from Illustrator. And there's a very handy tool. Uh, let me first show you what happens on small screens. So if I make my browser window smaller, you can see that the map is rotated. So right now, north is left instead of up. And if I make it even smaller, you can see that the text is now running over the, um, the map. So the reason for that is of course, if you have a map like this, which is very wide and not so high, it doesn't fit on a mobile phone. And so we made two versions of this map, one with north up and one with north to the left. And depending on how big the the browser window or the screen size is, it will show you one of the two versions. Um, and the tool that we use for that um, is was developed by the New York Times. It's called AI to HTML. Um, so it takes Adobe Illustrator files and it exports them to HTML. And um, if you're familiar with Adobe Illustrator, you know that you can have different artboards in your Illustrator um, document. And so what you can do with AI to HTML is make two versions of the map. So I, I just did that one with north up and one with north to the left. The script of AI to HTML exports the two versions. And then uh, again, with JavaScript, you can measure how big the browser window is and you can show either the one with north up or the one with north to the left. So AI to HTML. It's not a map specific tool, but it's really helpful if you want to have um, responsive graphics or show different versions of the same visualization on different screen sizes. Um, and then what I need to mention here, um, and some of you might know this, uh, natural earth data is a fantastic resource for free and quality geographical data. So um, it has many different uh, global data sets ranging from country boundaries over the disputed area areas, first order administration, uh, administrative uh, data, uh, populated places, um, water boundaries, um, ocean coastline. Um, and you have both the raster data and vector data. So what I used for my map about the oceans is this one, the bathymetry. Um, I just downloaded it from Natural Earth and stylized it in, in QGIS. And um, so Natural Earth data, I think is the best um, open, um, open source data, source data for uh, global data sets. Um, of course, you also have OpenStreetMap, but if you want to have base layers for your map, I think natural earth is a um, very good starting point. Then next map is an interactive map. And this I made for um, a Belgian newspaper who were have, uh, publishing a series about how Belgium or especially Flanders um, just has too much buildings and roads and concrete. Um, we have basically built up our region completely full. And this map shows you what Flanders, so Flanders is the northern part of Belgium, um, the Dutch speaking part of Belgium, um, how Flanders looked like in 1971. So the Flemish government published uh, these aerial photography of the whole um, region. And I took that data and I made a tool so that you could compare um, how things look like 50 years ago and uh, compare it with the current situation. So you have this look through glass in the middle. And if I move the map, you can see how that area looked like 50 years ago. Um, I'm just going to fly to a specific location. So 
this is where our national airport is. And you can see, for example, that this um, expressway was still under construction 50 years ago. You don't have the, the, the crossroads there. And also the, um, the airport was much smaller. And you could only see a couple of um, aeroplanes on the ground, while now it is much, much bigger and uh, more extensive. Um, you can also switch between the layers. So if you want to have the old imagery in the back and, um, and the new one in the center, you can also do that with this tool. So the technology behind this is Mapbox. And um, for interactive um, online slippy maps with, with which you can pen and zoom and fly to different locations, Mapbox is a good option. Um, the library they use used to be open source, but it isn't anymore. Um, but there is a fork called Map Libre, and um, it has basically the same functionality as um, the Mapbox library. So if you want to have an open source version, you can use Map Libre instead of Mapbox. And here is where I mention R. Um, because I used R to download the data from the Flemish government website and to process it and prepare it to upload it to, to Mapbox. So um, I have a little explanation on how I did that on my website. So here you have a little R code for downloading the data, converting it and, and transforming it. And um, so I, I used R to get this data and make it ready for the interactive map. So a lot of fancy tools. Um, I'm sorry, I missed one. So we're here. Um, this is a map I made for a client. So and this is on the website of a company called Van der Sat. And Van der Sat is a Dutch company. Um, focusing on measuring soil moisture from satellites. And so they have a very interesting technique um, with which they can measure um, how much water is contained in the upper layer of the soil. And they asked me to develop some maps and color palettes for their data. So you can see here a map of Belgium and the soil moisture content. Um, wet is blue and dry is orange. And this is also made with Mapbox. Um, but I also made another thing uh, for their website, which is this globe. And um, again, I'm not sure how this will display through the Zoom uh, stream, but it's uh, you should see a, a spinning globe. And uh, what you can do here is show different layers on the globe. So right now it's showing the soil moisture data that Van der Sat has, but um, they also have a, like a, a vegetation index, uh, something that shows the amount and health of vegetation. And they also have data on um, soil temperature. And it's a little bit of an interactive globe so you can rotate it yourself and you can zoom in to a certain level and, and you have these little dots showing the, the bigger cities and capitals. I use this uh, spinning globe as well in the sustainable development goal atlas. So let me show you how that works. So this is the sustainable development goal story about SDG 7 and um, sustainable Development Goal 7 is about affordable and clean energy. And we focused um, here on how many people have access to electricity. So we have a little chart showing that the connection to the electricity grid is getting up. Um, and then we also have this rotating spinning globe. And my apologies if this is not very visible or clearly visible in, in the Zoom um, stream, but you should have the links from my slides um, afterwards. So um, what we did here on this map is compare two regions in the world with roughly the same population. So on the left here, you see uh, the area around Washington DC in the United States. Uh, it's a circle with 150 kilometer radius. 
And in that circle, approximately 13.5 million people live. And you can see that it's brightly um, illuminated at night. So that means that, um, yeah, basically everyone has electricity there. You see a lot of the night lights. And on the other hand, we are comparing that with um, an area the same size and the same population. Um, and it, uh, this time we're in Uganda in a, a radius around a city called Katakwi. And you can see that there's almost no light there. So very few people have access to electric electricity in that area. And so on the globe, you see those two locations connected with an arc. You can click the globe and it will change the cities. Um, and you can also search for a city here. So for example, if I search for Johannesburg, Um, you'll see bright lights there, around 20 million people live there. And this is the same around Bujumbura in Burundi and very few lights there. So a lot less people have electricity there. And again, you can see both regions or cities highlighted on the map. So the technologies for these globes or the technology behind it is called Globe GL. And, um, Globe GL um, is like, um, it uses WebGL under the hood. So WebGL is a, a browser or web technology. And um, it just gives you some functions to easily display a globe and make it interactive. And there are also wrappers for React if you are using React as a framework. Um, so really handy. And um, it wasn't too complicated to build these um, these interactive globes. So yeah, a lot, a lot of fancy technologies, but sometimes um, I just want to quickly make a map. Um, and there are some online tools that can make very uh, simple maps in a, in a very quick way. And I just wanted to show you two of these um, online GUI tools. And the first one is called Flourish. And um, with that tool, I made a map um, of the 9,666 power plants in, uh, in the EU or in Europe. And so you can see them on the map. Uh, you can hover over each of these dots and um, the size of the dot represents the capacity of the plant and the color represents the primary source of the power plant. So pink are the um, nuclear power plants. Um, you can also zoom. So if I use my command key and zoom in, then uh, you can zoom on the map and zoom out back again. And uh, um, the legend is also interactive. So if you only would like to see, for example, the nuclear power plants, you can just uh, deselect all the other ones and you'll end up with a map showing only the nuclear power plants um, in Europe. So as I mentioned, this is made with Flourish and Flourish is an online tool with which you can make maps, but also a lot of different um, visualizations and um, also non-data um, um, non-data non interactive things like quizzes, for example. And it was, designed for newsrooms, but right now many people are using it. Um, and it has a free version and it doesn't require you to code. So you can just upload your data and configure the visualizations. And many of these templates in Flourish also are animated. Um, so I think it's the most powerful tool for making online animated things without having to code. And um, a big part are, of their templates are map-based, so you can make many different kinds of maps um, with Flourish. And then the last one, um, this is a cartogram um, that I, I made about CO2 emissions. So each country on this map is represented with a square and the size of the square represents the country's population. So the biggest ones are China and India. 
And the colors represent the emission per capita, the emissions of CO2 per capita per year. And the green ones have low emissions and the brown ones have high emissions. And so it's a way of showing both the population and the per capita emissions. So you, you'll see where the biggest emissions are coming from. Um, most of the African countries are in green and even in dark green, which means that they have very low emissions per capita. And so the tool I made this with is called Data Wrapper. And it's a bit similar to Flourish. Um, you can make uh, both charts and maps and also tables with Data Wrapper. And the maps come in three versions. So you can make choroplat maps with it. So it has these built in geographical data sets with different kinds of boundaries. So you can have it at country level, but for example, for my country in Belgium, they also have municipality level uh, base maps that you can use. So the only thing that you need to do is upload your tabular data that you want to show on the map. So you don't have to upload your uh, geographical data yourself. Um, you can also make symbol maps. So I showed you one made in Flourish, but I could have done the same thing in, in Data Wrapper. So I could have plotted the, the European power plants also in the same way. And then they also have locator maps um, to show a detailed um, area. Um, and uh, Data Wrapper was also designed with newsrooms and journalists in mind. Uh, so you don't have to be an, an expert in geographical data to make these kind of maps. And um, the output is quite good. So it's a, it's a really professional tool. And you get a free account um, for Data Wrapper. You won't have all the functionalities, but the, the basic ones um, will be there. So those were 10 maps and 10 tools. Um, there's some other references that I would like to share here. And um, one of these is my contribution to the 30 day map challenge um, two and a half years ago now. So the 30 day map challenge is a challenge to make one map each day for the month of November. And so that is quite intensive and um, I contributed to the first edition in 2019 and I collected all the maps that I made on my website and I also mentioned um, what tools I use for to make each of the maps so um, you'll find many different tools here uh, some of some of them I mentioned in in my talk but there are others too and so if you like you can check that out and then there is also the 30 day map challenge github page which has a lot of resources so um, i'm going to skim through this you have uh, like a list of data sources um, open street map i mentioned there is natural earth which i also mentioned but you can see that there are more data sets and you also have tools and here QGIS I showed you there is R and packages but um, you can see that there are a lot more and there are also tutorials and uh, helpful resources so I think this is a very nice collection of links if you want to get started with any of these tools or if you're looking for uh, some data sets. So that's all I wanted to show you. Um, you can find these slides at this URL, which is also in the Slack and also in the Google Doc. Um, these are my details if you want to reach me. Um, and um, ah, yes, maybe I should mention that many of the images in the slides are actually links. So here you have this image um, from the homepage of Data Wrapper, but you can click it and it will open uh, and uh, the data wrapper website. So um, if you use the slides, make sure to click the images because that is where the, the links are hidden. And so with that, I think um, we reached the end of my talk.